want you in here. It is tough. Uh, I was talking with our next speaker, and the post-lunch slot is the worst spot. Uh, it doesn't mean he's the worst guy, but it is the worst spot, right? Like, if we didn't give you any lunch at all, or didn't give you any breaks at all in the morning, so everyone's, like, kind of stretching their legs and stuff. So that was uh, my bad. So, um, again, we're going to get rolling here. Uh, I'm introducing a guy that's become a friend of mine. Actually, the very first time I met Dr. Paul Etchison, was it in the back of the bus at, in the Dominican Republic? That sounds way hotter than it really was. Um, we, <laughs> we, were, we were both taking the surgical aspect of Dr. Garg's Dominican Republic course, placing some implants, and uh, I got to talking with him, and he has a monster practice in the Chicago suburbs. He has grown it himself in a very authentic and realistic way. He's really good at communicating with his team. He's really good at motivating his team. He's, in a, he's, he's got a podcast called the Dental Practice Heroes Podcast. He's an author. He wrote the Dental Practice Hero book. He has a really cool take on all of this stuff. And I'm very glad that he decided to come speak at Voice of Dentistry. I'm not so glad that, that we put him in the, the after lunch slot, but he's going to crush it up here. So I welcome... Dr. Paul Etchison. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Hey, I like that. Well, thank you, everyone, for coming back from lunch. I'm excited to be here. We could use a few more people to trickle in, but we're just going to get started. Uh, the timer hasn't started yet, but I'm sure it will soon. All right. So I want you to go somewhere in your mind. The year is 2020. The entire human and animal population has almost been completely wiped off the face of the earth by invading aliens. They're strong. They're fast. They've got big teeth. And they look like that. Yes. But they're blind. They can't see. But they can hear really well. And if they hear you, they will find you, they will hunt you down, and you will die. Your life will be over. So I want you to think for a moment, you know, what would that be like? Knowing, like, could you ever be comfortable? You know, this was a really scary movie, at least for me. I guess not that scary. But it's weird that we watch this, me and my wife, because we hate scary movies. Like, the last scary movie I saw before this was The Grudge in, like, 2003. Like, has anyone seen that? Movie sucks. <laughs> like, I haven't slept in like 15 years and counting. Like, I hate that movie. But we went and saw this, so it was kind of cool, you know. Um, so this movie, there's this family, and they have to be quiet so the aliens don't find them and kill them. So, for instance, if you just, you know, happen to be, oh, this is the movie A Quiet Place. I don't know if I mentioned that or not. But this movie. So if you happen to be this kid, and you got a shuttle, and you're in the woods, that shuttle goes off, guess what? You're dead, man. That's it. If you're coming down the stairs, you step on a rusty nail, don't scream. Because if you do, you're going to die. If you're pregnant, and you're going to have a baby. You need to have it quietly. Like I know every mom in this room did, right? <laughs> right? So what would that be like? You know, would you ever feel safe? Could you ever feel human in a world like that, knowing that at any given moment, if you made a noise, you're going to die? You know, be quiet. Don't bump into anything. You know, don't knock anything over. Most importantly, don't say anything. Just be quiet. Don't say anything. So you might be wondering, what does this have to do with dentistry? Killer aliens, right? What is this tangent we're on here? So I'm going to tell you it's a whole lot, because safety is an amazing thing. Safety is a basic human need, just like warm water in the morning. And it, and did, did anyone else just like sit there and just turn it back and forth, just like, what the hell is wrong with this thing? That's funny, man. But safety is an amazing thing, OK? But in the movie, it's more physical safety. But I don't want to talk about physical safety. I'm going to talk about something called psychological safety. This is a term that was invented by Amy Edmondson. She's a professor at the Harvard School of Business, and she does a lot of work with just you know, high-performing teams. What makes them work? Business stuff. 
And she defines psychological safety as the belief that one will not be punished or humiliated for speaking up with ideas, questions, concerns, or mistakes. So she's talking about on businesses, teams, at our dental practices, you know? So in the movie, the easiest way for that family to be safe was just to be quiet. But what's it like in our dental practices? Now I want you to picture for a moment that you're, you're an employee, you're a team member, and you're in a team meeting, and people are discussing something. What if you don't want to look ignorant? What if you don't want to look stupid? What if you don't want, don't want to be disruptive? What do you do? You just be quiet. You don't say anything. What if you don't want to look incompetent? Well, first of all, just don't try anything hard, because you might fail. And if you do try something hard and you do fail, just cover it up. Don't tell anyone about it. Don't admit it. So the easiest way to stay safe is just like the movie. Just be quiet. So I kind of want to talk about the research that she did that led her to this, this term. And she was tasked with looking at eight different hospitals and looking at, you know, what are the better teams? What are the worst teams between these eight hospitals? And then she looked at something called adverse drug events which is just you know, giving the patient the wrong medication, giving the patient the wrong dosage, things with like potentially life-threatening consequences. And she wanted to see, was there a correlation between the quality of the team and the adverse drug event? And as we would think, you know, better teams work together better, they would have least, uh, less errors. So let's look at, at her results here. So these are the eight teams on the left, and these are the results on the right, they're errors. Now, it looks like this is a range from most errors to least errors. But you see a little part in the middle, it just doesn't really jive, you know? So what is that? Why is that? Because this is not a range that way. This is a range from the best teams on the top to the very worst teams on the bottom. The best teams had the most errors, and the worst teams had the least. Now, that doesn't really make sense. Why would that be? So look at that word right next to errors reported errors. The best team had the most reported errors. So it wasn't necessarily that they, they had more errors, they were just more comfortable reporting them. They were more comfortable like, admitting them when they made a mistake. So why is it important that we can admit our mistakes where we work? I want you to think back to a time that you learned a lesson from a mistake you made. Sometimes you learned a hard lesson. We all got those moments in our lives. You know, we all go to like this seminar and there's someone on the podium and they're showing you, they, they say, hey, I'm going to show you everything I've screwed up, all my mistakes so you can learn from them and you don't have to repeat them. And then we all sit there and take notes and nod our head. We go, yeah, yeah, oh, I would never do that. That's stupid, right? And then like two months later, we go back to our practice and we do that. The same thing they said not to do. Why is that? Because we're human. We're dumb. We have to learn on our own. We have to learn from our own mistakes. Think about a time you had a coach or consultant come into your practice and they gave you some feedback or you just even had a friend that was like, hey, you know what, I just kind of don't agree with you on that. And you're like, well, oh man, you know, you kind of learned something. You had that aha moment. I never thought of it that way. You know, we, we all have moments like that. See, what we need to realize is that every time we communicate, Every time that we give somebody some feedback, we give some coaching, we say, hey, you know what, I screwed something up. You admit that you were wrong. You're taking an interpersonal risk. We're taking a risk that that person we're communicating with is going to look negatively upon us. And the easiest way to mitigate the risk is to just be quiet. Just don't say anything. But when we're quiet, in our organizations, we rob our team of the ability to learn from our mistakes. We rob our team to the ability to collaborate, to innovate, to grow, to become their best versions of our practice. One of the big buzzwords we hear in dentistry, and we've heard it a few times a day, is systems. Man, it's 2019. This is the year I'm going to get my systems together. I'm going to systematize my practice. I gotta, he's got systems. I need them. Forget the systems. Forget it. I'm not saying they're not important. But before you have systems, you need a great team that can work well together. And before you have that, you need to have leadership. We talk about leadership words, communication, vision, integrity, you know, charisma, humility. But I think one of the most overlooked things of leadership is the ability of the leader to create an area, to create a workplace that's psychologically safe so that our team can work together comfortably. 
This is a diagram from my book. Heroic leadership creates the great teams which create the great systems. If you have a great team, they will make the great systems, but only in the right environment, only in an environment of psychological safety. So here we are, 2019, VOD. Think about your practice. Do you have a safe place or a quiet place? Because one of the worst parts about having a quiet place is that you may not even know that you have one because nobody on your team has the balls to tell you about it. Because the last time they told you something, you chewed their head off and you made them feel like crap about it. See, silence is an invisible act. We don't know when somebody doesn't say something. And if you have a quiet place at your practice, all of your success could be a complete illusion until one day one of your best team members quits and you're sitting there going, I can't believe it. Why are you quitting? And they're not even gonna give you the real answer because you've trained them not to. You've created the quiet place. There's something called fear-based management, fear-based leadership. And this is basically the, you know, you're gonna come in, you're gonna come in quiet, you're gonna leave quiet, you're gonna shut up, you're not gonna question me, you're gonna do as I say, because it's my practice, and I said so, it's mine. Right? And all this does is this creates fear in our employees. They shut down, they armor up, they no longer care about the organization, the goals, the goals of the team. All they care is about themselves. Staying out of trouble, not looking stupid. I have two daughters, an eight-year-old and a three-year-old. One day they were fighting over a toy and I said to my oldest, I said, hey Briella, why can't Alyssa play with your toy? She goes, dad, this is my toy and I said so. Does that sound familiar? This is my practice and I said so, I'm the boss, I make the rules. It doesn't work, it's childish. And we expect that from an eight-year-old. We do not expect that from a leader of practice, especially a successful one. So there are a lot of successful dentists in this room right now. And I hope you get to talk to them, ask them why their practice is doing so well. And I think most of them are gonna say the same thing. They're gonna say it's because of their team. Having an amazing team is what's gonna take your practice to the next level. This is my team. We did a startup seven years ago and we've grown to a team of 25. And I promise you, our success is because of those girls. I'm part of it too, but it's me and them working together as a team. And I truly believe in my heart that we have the best dental team in the universe. I believe that. So there's something really cool that happened in this picture, but I'm gonna come back to it in just a few minutes. So I hope at this point I've convinced you psychological safety at the practice is important. So how do we do it? What do we do? The first step is framing. This is communicating the vision. This is, we need to let our team know two things. That failure is okay and it's, ex and it's expected. Because they're gonna screw things up. I have great systems at my practice. And we screw things up all the time because we're human. I want my team to be more afraid of letting the patient down than they are about looking stupid in front of their team members. So we have two mantras at my practice. We have a lot, but these are two of them. We have a culture of coachability. This means that anyone on my team is free to coach anyone else on my team as long as it's for the good of the practice. And that person, that's being getting, the one that's getting coached, cannot get defensive. You know, easier said than done. But this is my vision. We have grace over guilt. This means if you raise your hand and you contribute something, or if you say, you know what, I don't really understand that. You know, I mean, I need more training. I don't really know how to do that. Or you say, hey doc, you know what? I really screwed something up with Mrs. Jones today. We are gonna offer you grace and forgiveness. We're not gonna make you feel guilty because I wanna know about these things and I wanna encourage that behavior. Second part is participation. We need everybody to participate. So if you want your team to admit when they've done something wrong or you want your team to feel comfortable saying like, I don't know, well then you have to start by doing that. Be vulnerable. Stop acting like you have all the answers. You know, we all have that one Facebook friend that has all the answers, the perfect family. How, how well do we relate to that person? It's not real. And the other thing is ask questions. We need to invite in with our, we need to invite uh, discussion with our team. So if you take one thing from this weekend, 
And I guarantee this, I guarantee this will revolutionize your practice and it is so freaking easy to do. Take everybody that works for you one by one into your office, shut the door and just have a real conversation with them. Ask them questions like, how are things going here? What are we not doing so well? What can we do better? How can I be a better boss, trainer, mentor? How can I make you like your job more? Do you even like your job? And you're gonna get some real answers. And you're going to want to get defensive because that's the natural, that's the lizard brain. But this comes to the third part, responding productively. See, just like trust, psychological safety is not a switch that we can just flip on. We can't just show up at our practice money and go boom. Hey, guess what guys, it's safe here. Let's talk about feelings. It doesn't work like that. It's like trust, it's built one conversation at a time. And it takes one conversation to ruin it. So when somebody takes that interpersonal risk, you know, when they take that interpersonal, that they communicate something, we need to acknowledge that risk taking. We need to thank them for it because that's what we want to encourage. Stop blaming people. It doesn't matter. You know, the case didn't go out. What case, whose case was that? Who was the assistant on that? Who was it? Who cares? The case didn't go out. What can we come up with as a team so that doesn't happen again? Let's make a system for that. So I said there's something special about this picture. And it's those five girls sitting in the front. We did a startup seven years ago. And these were my original five. They still work for me. Seven years. And we took a team picture every year around the year anniversary. And you will see the same people in the following year, in the following year, in the following year. Because in seven years, our turnover has been zero. Not a single person has left. And I don't say this to brag. But I want to illustrate a point that if you have psychological safety at your practice, you are going to find out about and address any issue long before anyone leaves. So I want you to take a look at your practice when you get back there Monday. Because when we have fear in our practice, when our employees are afraid, they will never go above and beyond for us. They will never take that baton and run with it because they're so damn scared about what's going to happen if they drop it. See, it's our job as the leaders of the practice to create this environment of psychological safety so our teams can collaborate, they can grow, they can work together. And that's what I've tried to do with my practice. And I assure you, every single person on my team, in their heart, is 100% confident to take that baton and carry it for the entire team. All the while knowing that when they drop it, not if, because they're going to drop it, but when they drop it, that we're gonna talk about it, we're gonna learn something from it, and we're gonna forgive and continue to love that person because our practice is a safe place and not a quiet one. Thank you, hope that helps somebody. Dr. Paul Etchison, everyone, put your hands together. Wow, nice job, Paul, you crushed that. All right, so I had Paul, we had Paul in the Dental Hacks a few weeks back, and um, he was really good, and I knew he was going to be speaking then, but wow, thank you very much, Paul, that was fantastic. Okay, I want to thank another one of our sponsors, one of the silver sponsors, the Dental Success Network. The CEO, if you remember correctly, spoke earlier this morning, that's Dr. Mark Costas. So go out and check out the Dental Success Network in the, uh, in the lobby there. So we have a real treat coming up here. Our next speaker... Uh, Dr. Payray, you guys have probably seen him if you're on Instagram at all. Uh, he's a fantastic dentist, got out in 2014, took the world by storm, took a ton of CE, does some amazing dentistry, but most importantly, he does some amazing photography. And guess what? He's going to tell you all about that. Welcome to the stage, Dr. Payray. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm mean, actually, there's the clicker. I need. Oh, I, oh, the pointer? The pointer, yeah. Paul, you got the pointer? There it is right there. This one? Yep, that's the one. That'll do it. Perfect. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> Actually, before I even start, let me get on Instagram. Let's do this. I'm going to do this um, real quick story. 
And I want you guys to kind of hype it up. I want this to kind of be loud. Next year, we want more people here. So let's cheer up. Say hi, VOD. <laughs> All right, cool. I'm super excited um, to do this. I'm very honored. This is my first time actually giving this lecture. So bear with me. I normally lecture on implants, full mouth reconstruction. I do case acceptance um, for BioHorizons. I do a lot of things, but this photography is one of my favorite ones, and I had a lot of fun time making it. And I only have right now 18 minutes, 49 seconds, so I'm gonna get <laughs> started because I only have that much time. Let's go. All right, I'm gonna stop here, but what I wanted to go to talk about today, um, for 20 minutes, I was gonna give you 20 tips and tricks. Now, of course, this is not gonna happen all in just 20 minutes. I'm gonna do some high-level uh, views of photography, dental photography. We're gonna start with the need, why, um, and then we're gonna get into cameras, settings, some of the uh, uh, basic, pretty much, parameters of cameras, for example, the mode dial, the white balance, and then after that, I want to get into some consent, like how do I even take pictures? Um, first thing I do, my practice is pretty social, so everybody that gets in, they probably get filmed from the assistants to all the patients, so everybody gets consent. After that, I'm going to talk to you guys about the equipment. So I think that's really one of the funnest part because a lot of these pictures that you see, if you have the same equipment, so I think you can do the same thing, and they're not really that expensive. So I'll give you links and everything. Uh, actually, one thing also I want to mention that I decided when I was making this PowerPoint, because it's so much stuff, in 20 minutes I'm not able to give you all of it. And what I wanted to do, uh, talking to my good buddy Blake with Implant Compare, we're going to do a webinar. Uh, this is actually going to be an hour and an hour and a half where I'm going to give you all the links, the tips in more details. If you have any questions on the settings, on all the social media stuff, um, that's where I'm going to be talking more deep. Right now I'm going to mostly focus on a few things out of these 20. And as you see, we're going to get into some photography. I'm going to show you some pictures. I'm going to get into lab, communication. Then we'll talk about post-production. Now, what, what do I do when I take them? How do I organize them? What are the apps that I use on my phone? Um, how do I store them? And then I'm going to talk to you guys uh, just to give you some options of some of the places you can learn, now either online or hands-on. And that's pretty much what we're going to do. Now, first thing first, the need, and this is one of the first thing I wanted to talk to, uh, to you guys about, that how important photography has been for me personally is that if it wasn't for photography, I wouldn't be here right now talking to you guys, and that's, I think, that's how, that says a lot. Not only me educating at, right out of school, I'm only 31, but right now I've been speaking in some of the high levels, I get paid to speak, um, I do educational stuff, and I also have a private practice that I started right, right from scratch. And I'm proud to say in the second year, right from in the heart of Nashville, I was able to do 1.7 million. A lot of that has to do with what I've been doing with photography, with videos, with testimonials, so much more. But for me, it's been such a learning experience too because when I take pictures, I go back and look at them. And I learn so much. I connect with people. We had a whole Dental Influencers Alliance. I don't know if you guys heard DIA, but that was just about photography and people getting together. So. I'm very passionate about this subject. That's why I wanted to not only talk here, but also have a webinar later on Implant Compared to talk more in detail. So let's go next. Um, 
also the selling point of some of these before afters. For example, these are some of the extra oral pictures. I'm gonna show you some of these later, but they are more about uh, how much words don't mean nothing really to patients. It's really the pictures. I used to talk so much in the consult room telling patients what they need, show them x-rays and everything. Now, I just have to show them pictures. Now, when they come in with a number 20, for example, broken, I have number 20s on my Dropbox that are just type in number 20, and they can see before and after. I don't have to get in details. Now, of course, if I do educational stuff, I'm gonna show some bloody pictures and some of that fun uh, photography, but if it's just the patient, it's just before and after, and that's it, they're sold. Now, your need, what are you, you gonna use photography for? I mean, at this day and age, we were talking with my buddy Soli, millennial dentist, <laughs> the real millennial dentist, um, that about how much is important to know what we're doing with these pictures. Now with me, it's been the learning and teaching and showing pictures and doing advertising for my office. Now whatever it is for you, just take out of how much you could do uh, with photography. And that's a good book, Simon Sinek, um, if you ever get that, I would love that. Um, I always read it every few, every few months. I get back and read a few pages. Now, now we're gonna get into some of the basic stuff, like cameras, we're gonna get into lenses, and um, some flash stuff. Now camera, I really recommend Nikon or Canon. Those are the two that I really do recommend. I have Nikon, I put, I highlighted the yellow, those are the Nikon D7500, and I have the D810 that is a full frame. Um, that, those are the two bodies that I recommend. Now of course, if you have Canon, I would stick to it. Um, and you can get uh, more and more information, again, going by these uh, comparison of the website. Uh, if you t just type in one of them and just type in uh, comparison, you could see the chart and learn a little bit more of the differences. But those are the two that I recommend. With the lenses, really what you need is a macro lens. That's absolute uh, necessary. I think with any photography in dental, you need macro, photo uh, macro lenses and the range should be around 90 to 105. This is my actual macro lens uh, with the Nikon that I have, and that's absolutely the best lens that I take most of my pictures from. So everything you see probably is from that lens today. After lenses, um, flash is so important. I'm not a big fan of ring light. I think it washes the pictures, so I really like to have two lights coming from the outside to kind of balance each other. When I had the ring light, I noticed a lot of my photos are just washed out. It's too light, it's too much. But whenever you have two light from different sources, like a bracket or strobes, um, that helps a lot. That's my setting in my office. Um, I have a room dedicated to photography. Now, of course, when I opened, one of the rooms, um, I, I didn't furnish it for dentistry. I just furnished it for photography and videography. It's changed a little bit, but it's still, I have two strobe lights. I added one more strobe behind the patient so that way I can get a very, very clear white background. So some of the pictures I'm gonna show you, that's what I normally now have um, in that setting. This is actually a picture of, or the video of how I have it set up with the links. So you can see the, one of the strobes behind the patient. And this is the mount. Now if I choose to use this, this is pretty heavy. So I normally really don't even use that anymore. I use the strobes. And I have a strobe with a mount in the operatory. I'll show you how that looks later. Um, so here's some of the settings. Now, I don't want to really get into the details of what shutter speed is, what's aperture, what's the um, ISO. Those three together gives you the exposure. I just get straight to the point. All you need to really know from this is the aperture for the portraits when I take before and after. I have the f-stop around 12 to 14 or 16. Now if I take intraoral, I have to have more depth of focus. I need more teeth to be in, um, in the focus. So that's why I use f-stop goes up to 22 and some of the close-ups I go all the way to 30. So this is a good slide if you guys wanna take a snap of that. That's some of the basic settings. Now of course I change um, some of the aperture but normally my shutter speed and ISO stays the same. So if you choose ISO of 100, I even sometimes bring it down to 64. But 100 is really normal, that's what I have. The shutter speed, I always have it either at one over 160 or one over 200 of the second. Um, 
And for aperture, again, that's the one that I use to change um, if I change anything. Here's a good triangle as well. Again, if I do more, talk about it more, I can go in details of the differences and all. But I don't think you really need to know that in 20 minutes, you know, there's not much time to talk about the details. So this is why um, what I do. The mode dial is also important. Now, some people like to do automatic. I'm pretty manual. I think you can really learn to be manual. If you don't like manual, you can do aperture priority. That's where you choose the aperture and the camera chooses the ISO and the shutter speed for you. So that's something you could have. But normally I have manual and those are the settings that I told you that I usually try to keep. Here's a white balance. That's very important, especially in dentistry. I think there are so much pictures that you see online that the picture looks either too warm or too cool. I like the range of 55 to 6,500. Now, whenever you have um, on your camera, you can go in and those are the settings. I usually like to have the daylight. Um, if I have the flashes, I, do the, I choose the flash. But if I have some other lights in the operatory, I choose the daylight. Those are the two that I use. Um, in the post-production, after you take the pictures, those, are also could, those also could be modified. Like you could change the white balance and so what uh, not, but you could always um, choose it to where you don't have to even go back and change it after you took the photo. Um, the consent, so now this is the 11th tip out of 20. How am I doing? Seven minutes, 48 seconds, that's good. So consent, like I said, I, every patient gets one of these. There are three levels. So level one is when they, everybody gets it. Now, if I, th those are completely restricted to just patients' um, records, kind of like every other thing that they, you do. Level two is when you uh, use it for educational stuff. So I tell the patients, your eyes really not gonna show, it's just intraoral. So level three is when I can market it, I could do anything I wanna do. And that's where patients um, understand all of those before they, um, I start producing. Like, so if you see a picture with any of these photos of the patient, I have the consent. And that's very important in this day and age that you need to have that. The accessories, these are some of the equipments that I use. I start with the softbox and the strokes. And I thought, what is the, the best way to do it? I really try to screenshot my, or video, take a screen of my cell phone, and this is what you could see from Amazon that I have. Um, from the softbox and strobes perspective. The brand is Neewear. That's the one that's very popular. And this is the mounted bracket that I was showing you at photomed.net. Now, if you really want to get on photomed, some of their stuff I think is very overpriced. You don't really need to. I don't know if they're outside, honestly, if they're sponsoring, but some of their stuff is ridiculously more expensive than it needs to be. Here's the mount that I have in the operatory. This is actually Tuesday that I, I have that mount from Amazon. Like I said, some of these links, if you guys want to get on that um, webinar, you'll be able to access all of that through there, um, how to get this, because I, I get a lot of messages from Instagram. Everybody asks, like, how do you, where do you get that? Um, and I can give you all that information after. The retractors are so important. These are the retractors that I like. I call them T-shaped, um, and here's, I think, I have, yeah, here's a video of it. These are my favorite ones. There are some that I'll show after this that our patient can use them. I don't like those. This is the other one that I like for some of these pictures. You definitely want to have all their cheeks retracted and they don't, you don't want to see them. And this is what I use for occlusal photos um, to keep the uh, lip, upper lip out or lower lip out. The mirrors, I like the Osong. Um, their website is osongusa.com, and those are the ones that have handles, and those are my favorite. I use those a lot with every, pretty much with all my occlusal pictures and buckle shots, some of the lateral angles, I use those mirrors. Let's get into uh, pretty much shadow boxes or for if you do any sort of veneers, you like to take pictures of models or things you get from the lab. That's where you need the shadow box. Now, again, I, I just kind of was surprised because I was looking at PhotoMed, it was 300 bucks. The same thing on Amazon is, it comes in next to see how much. It 
It's 85 bucks, and that's the one I have. So you don't really need to spend a lot of money on some of this stuff. The, the mirrors, retractors, softboxes, and all of that together shouldn't be more than really four or 500 bucks. And that's, I mean, that's gonna last you a lot longer than you think. Uh, some of those, uh, especially the Osong mirrors, those are very good. Ring light is good for videography. If you do any videos, um, I love those ring lights from Amazon again. That's where I have it in, the, in my operatory. So when I do videos, I use them. The batteries, I like these batteries from Amazon. So if you, uh, they're rechargeable. This is all throughout the office, really. I use them uh, for remotes, mouse, whatever. Um, you're very good. And then the SD cards uh, towards the end. Is, uh, the main thing about them is that 95 megabyte per second. Some of these photos that you're going to take, they're so huge that you want to be able to transfer them fast. And I use that SD card. Now let's get into some photography. This is where a lot of my cases I could show on what I use. So for example, frontal view, that's one that you want to take from just the natural smile. You ask the patient to smile, and this is what you see. Um, these are real cases, real pictures that I've taken through the year, uh, four or five years that I've been out of school, and I'm learning. I continuously learn. I've taken about 20, 30,000 photos on Dropbox right now, and I keep learning more that I see how I need to manipulate my angles and so forth. This is retracted, and those are the mirror or the cheek retractions that you saw. These are what I uh, use to take them. They're both the same. Now, if you look at the lower shot, and those are the ones that I don't like, where they are attached together. I like the T ones, um, and that's why I don't like that lower picture, because the, if you notice, you could see the angles of um, the, the retractors, and they're blue, even that makes it even worse. I'm getting picky about some of this. <laughs> okay, so retracted. Now, this is contraster. The contraster, the, my favorite ones are the bendable ones. There are some that are like rubber made, the bendables, the, those are my favorite. Um, there are some more. You could take pictures of your preps. Now, I will get into more details as far as what are my settings on every single one of these pictures in the webinar, but right now, just to give you some ideas of how I use, utilize these equipments that I just showed you previously. Um, these are, again, lateral views. I focus on the canine on my, can uh, on my lateral views. I want to make sure that the retractor for the angle that I'm taking the picture is retracted pretty fully on that side. And the other one, I don't really care about it. I could hold it still. So as you can see, like, um, and, and I get into some of the errors. Like, when I see the um, upper picture, I don't really see the back teeth because the shadow is covered. So the way that I have the light that could be changed, and I could see more of that back, um, back teeth. Again, some of the lateral views, I'm going to kind of get going. There's only a couple minutes left. So the occlusal shots, these are the mirror shots. These are very hard to take. Uh, so I usually use um, my assistant. I have my assistant. We have air. There's a lot of stuff. So I talk about postures, how do you position patients, and a lot of that stuff I can't really talk about it in 20 minutes. So um, those are going to be shared later. If you follow me on Instagram, you could see a lot of these photos. I go into the webinar more in details how I captured these. What are my settings? Um, and then the close-ups, these are the ones that you really want to get in detail one-to-one. Uh, -one. The f-stop for these is almost 32. Uh, so it's very, very close. Um, this is the tour I forget <laughs> if you haven't seen that. I think that's pretty much the biggest tour I've ever seen. So I had to take a picture. Then the extra orals, I think I've shown you this already, but how much this is already selling. I have so many of these photos. I have probably what you guys have seen on Instagram or what I show is about 30% of what I have. I just don't have enough time to put these together and, and, and give the content. Lab communication is very important. I'll go over more of that later. I don't have the time, the video. The post-production, the Lightroom, Adobe, these are some of the ones I use to organize, like how do I do these photos. Then getting close, the apps, Implant Compare, that's when you download if you want to get into that webinar. The, some of the other apps that I have. Um, then I got the storage, I keep everything on Dropbox. The learning stuff, I have Miguel Ortiz. I actually talked to him before coming today. He said for anybody to call him, if you guys want to take any of these courses, both of them, 
uh, one by Eduardo Aguar and one by Miguel Ortiz. If you guys call them and mention my name, they're gonna hook you up and give you a discount. So those are two of the courses you could do hands-on. I've taken both of them. I brought both of them to Nashville. So I'm very good friends with both of them. If you get on Eduardo's website, that's uh, where, um, when the pictures really matter. And to the left, that's Miguel Ortiz. And they're both very knowledgeable about photography. I learned a lot uh, from both of them. Here is some of the free sources online and some of the ones that you could pay. And that's pretty much it. And here's my contact. <laughs> I was able to finish. I was only 45 seconds or so. <laughs> but thank you so much. Give it up for Dr. Payray. Nice. Thank sure, you. I'll teach you photography in 20 minutes. No problem. <laughs> nice. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. It was great. I want to give it up for Dr. Payray one more time. That was fantastic. So this is tough, right? This is the first time we've done this. We're asking dentists to do really short, short stuff. And dentists are not really into that. You ask a dentist what time it is, and they explain how to build a clock, right? So 20 minutes, 30 minutes, this is really interesting. I like this, and I like how it's working. So thank you very much. And uh, a couple things. First off, Dr. Payray, co-host of the Millennial Dentist Podcast. I didn't say that. That's like, this is a podcast meeting. He needs to get that credit. The other thing is, uh, Dr. Paul Etchison, his message is in the book that he wrote. And he, it's for sale out there. So go, go buy some books from Paul. He's fantastic. Give it up for Paul one more time. I just love that guy. Okay. Another one of our silver sponsors, Proceed Finance. They're right out the door here to the left. Go check them out, and we thank them for supporting us. Our next speaker, I got a chance to meet her. Uh, she's kind of an amazing deal because, okay, so she's a pediatric dentist in the Chicago area. Uh, she started a Facebook group and a podcast not that long ago called the Mommy Dentists in Business. One of the things I like about this the most is, of course, they talk a lot about dentistry. They talk about how to do it, but they also talk about how to be a human being as a dentist as well. This is a really tight group. I have some friends in this group that they spend their time there instead of the Dental Hacks Nation. Smart people, those people. But uh, you know what? She's going to fill us in on all this stuff. Dr. Grace Young, welcome to the stage. Thank you. Is this is it on the mic? On? Okay. Hi, I'm Dr. Grace Yum, and yes, that's my real name, Yum. And my patients call me Dr. Yum Yum, Dr. Yummy. My I'm a pediatric dentist, and my practice name is Yummy Dental and Orthodontics for Kids. Any pediatric dentists here? Awesome. All right, and um, I'm also the founder of Mommy Dentist in Business. Raise your hand if you're a Mommy Dentist in Business. Woo! All right, I think um, I look pretty good today. I didn't want to jump in a cold shower, but I'm used to it because moms don't shower every day anyway, <laughs> right? So um, if I smell, I'm sorry, but I think half of you do too. Um, but anyway, Yummy Dental and Orthodontics, I'm in Chicago. Anybody from Chicago? Yes, all right, Chi-Town. Right now it's Chiberia. I just left Six Degrees, um, and it's so nice to be warm here. And I literally rolled out of the airport in my, I call it a, uh, like a slumber bag, you know, like a sleeping bag. I have a sleeping bag coat from like here all the way to my toes. And when I got off the plane, everyone looked at me like, where's she coming from, Alaska? So um, yes, Chicago is my hometown. I was born there. And I'm a Cuz fan. Cuz fan, anyone? North side. Um, but yeah, so my practice is close to Wrigleyville, which is near the Cubs Stadium. I have the pleasure of treating some of the Cubs players' children and also Blackhawks because of where I'm located. And what's really funny is that, like, a famous person can, like, walk past me and I'll have no idea. And some of these players come in and I'm like, nice to meet you. I have no idea who they are. And the kids in the front and the parents are all like, you don't know, like, taking pictures. Um, it's really kind of fun. My practice is all about having a fun time in, in a safe and fun environment. Um, so today I really wanted to talk about your voice. And as cheesy as it sounds, 
you know, voices of dentistry. I had to do a play on words. What is the purpose of your voice? As podcasters, we all have voices, right? And we use our voice to help people, help dentists, help the dental industry. And for my mission, to help mommy dentists. And it's basically to support each other. I mean, I know Matt, daddy dentists, raise your hand. Are you a daddy dentist? Yes, we need a podcast about daddy dentists. You know, we as parents take our job as parents seriously. That's like our number one thing. That is my number one priority is my children. And second is my practice. Although I had my practice first before having kids, so I often feel like my practice is my child. Um, so I, and I have a second location out in the suburbs. It's a satellite office, and it, the city feeds the, the suburban practices. So for any of you guys who are like thinking, oh, I want to have a second office or multiple, or people who are like, why in the world would you do that? That's crazy. Um, you know, it has to make sense. And for me, that's what I have done. Um, but when you talk about your voice, literally, we're talking about communication. How do you communicate with your team? How do you communicate with your patients? How do you communicate with your dental industry, people that provide services for you? And how do you communicate with your community? That's all really, really important because the way you communicate and the way you use your voice can bring team members attracted to you or can deter team members. And I, um, the other doctor that was up here saying that he had, had turnover in seven years that is amazing. Um, I've, impre I've had my own office for 10 years, and I can say that I do not have that track record. So um, kudos to him. But then also, how you communicate with your patients can bring new patients in. Like, all of a sudden, they're like, I'm going to refer my cousin, my aunt, my neighbor, my PTA. Or the way you communicate might turn someone off and be like, I would never come back here again and I'm never going to refer anybody and then leave a bad review, blah, blah, blah. Um, so we have to think about how we're communicating with our patients and the industry, you know, how we're communicating with people that are servicing us and helping us grow our practices, whether it's equipment, software, um, you know, your weave is weave in here. I know that they were out there. So I think that's really important to have those good relationships and also your community. I think it's really important to give back to your community. Uh, raise your hand if you somehow do some philanthropy in your community. I think that for me, when I was in dental school, and I don't want to date myself, um, that was something that, we, that was really, really talked about, is giving back to your community. And I think that when you do, it comes back to you in ways that you wouldn't know. So I definitely think that if you don't do any philanthropy, maybe consider it, you know, instead of someone choosing you as their philanthropy, you choose your philanthropy. The next slide I, I wanted to talk about was um, the other part, the other definition, the other meaning of voice. Because a lot of people in here who do marketing and branding often say, well, what's your voice? Or you do social media and it's like, well, what's your voice? And you might hire a, a team, a social media team, and they don't understand your voice, and they start pushing things out, and people are like confused, like, well, why is that on your feed? That disconnect there can make people confused. So it's really important to identify what is your voice, what's your brand. It could come down to your logo, your font, your colors. You want to tie everything together so that when people see you, they're like, that's Dr. Yum, you know? When they see my logo or my social media or my website, it's really clear that that's Dr. Yum's practice. Um, and maybe you're in an area where you don't have a lot of competition or you kind of like, well, I don't really need to do that. I think that it, it still is important to give your patients an understanding of where you're coming from and what kind of dentist you are and what kind of dentist you want to be. Um, and if you don't have a brand or, or, or you're not thinking about having one or you don't know how to create one, I think it would be wise to kind of visit your vision. You know, what is your vision for your practice, yourself, and go from there and then and create something that would be your voice that your patients can identify. Um, 
for me, you know, I'm lucky enough that I have great millennials on my team. Millennials can either drive you crazy or you can really love them. And I love my millennials <laughs> because I wouldn't be able to do this by myself. Uh, but on this is our YouTube channel. And each thumbnail, you can see that it has a specific font, specific colors, just the way we put everything out. When someone visits this channel, they're like, that is yummy dental. And so I think when it's all kind of organized and clear and presented that way, people will automatically recognize you and that you stand out from the rest, stand out from the crowd. Um, so it could be from your website to your you know, Facebook, to your Instagram, to YouTube, to Twitter, whatever social media channel you use, I think it's really important to have a very clear, clear voice. Um, my number one takeaway really is just to be consistent and don't mix it all up and be confusing. I think if you want to be strong and stand in your brand, it needs to be consistent from start to finish. So I think in my area in the city, um, I get new patients mostly because of the internet or word of mouth. And so the first impression they have of me is my website. And I have patients coming in being like, I read your website like from start to finish. And I'm like, you're a teacher or you're a lawyer. <laughs> because I know if another dentist were to visit my website, they would not read the whole thing. And that they say often, I really, really liked your website. I chose you out of you know, the number of dentists because I really connected with your website. And for me, again, that voice is connecting with my patients, whether they're new or they're returning, that they can identify who I am by reading what I put on the website. Um, so that's it, that's my message. And I hope that you'll consider really being consistent in your brand and enjoy the Voices of Dentistry. Thank you so much. Give it up for Dr. Grace Yum. Thank you. Thank you so much. Go join her Facebook group, Mamas. I think that's where you need to be. All right. Let me find my card here. Sorry. We'd like to thank our silver sponsor, Weave. Now, Weave is across the, across the floor from the door. They have some of their products sitting right out there to give it a try. Go try Weave. Now, I have the pleasure of introducing our next speaker. Dr. Russell Kirk. He has a podcast called The Business of Dentistry. He has a digital magazine called Owner Magazine, which if you have not checked out yet, it's very good. It's very cool. Delivered digitally. It's brilliant. I love it. He's been on the Dental Hacks a bunch of times. Actually, he's, I visited him at his home, everything like that. He's an oral surgeon, and I'm willing to forgive him that because he's not like most oral, uh, oral surgeons that I've met. Uh, one of the sweetest guys you'll ever met and ever meet, and he's going to talk a little bit about burnout today. So give it up for Dr. Russell Kirk. Ten to twelve. Ten to twelve dentists. Ten to twelve dentists in this room, statistically speaking, are suffering from burnout. That's probably the low end, if we want to be honest. That doesn't include any dental hygienists, any dental assistants, any dental team administrators that might be here with us today, because the number's going to be higher. This is a, a quote by Sun Tzu. If you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of 100%. I'm a huge fan of Sun Tzu. One of the requirements or recommended reading in the War College, uh, did the Navy War College. And what really is interesting about Sun Tzu is he talks a lot about physical warfare, the physical attributes of warfare, but he has a lot about psychological warfare. And you, you probably all know of him. Uh, the books have been translated in multiple languages and they've been brought into business and personal growth and development. So what I want to do today, I want to start out with two purposes. We're going to talk about knowing the enemy knowing the enemy of burnout, professional burnout, and then want to focus a little bit at the end on knowing thyself, the second part of this. So what is burnout? What is professional burnout? It's a psychological syndrome. 
it is where we're unable to adapt to job stress. Because that's basically what it is. It's job stress that's gotten beyond where we can adapt as individuals, as professionals, and what we do in a day -to, on a day-to-day -day basis. And there's no clear-cut or sharp boundaries with this syndrome. This is a, a schematic that I reproduced. It's a schematic from a study on physicians. And I thought it was well done because really burnout falls on a scale or on a spectrum. Going from, in our case, from my right to the left, starting with stress, normal stress that we have in our day-to-day -day practices and the way we deal with it. And then as we start to fail to adapt to those, we move into burnout. Burnout is upstream. It's the precursor for depression and for potential suicidal ideations and suicide. Wish I had a goat to go with. Oh, look, there's a goat. So this is, this is Ghost with local med. Ghost, this is Peggy. And I, got, I picked Peggy out, and I found out about Ghost being here, so I, I wanted to bring him into the conversation. But Peggy, Ghost, is a three-legged goat. And it was very specific that I picked this three-legged goat. She won a race. There's a craft brew, uh, brewery up in Pennsylvania. Some of you may be from Pennsylvania may know about it. But every year they have a goat race. And so Peggy entered the goat race one year as a three-legged goat. And she didn't win the first year. She was only five months old, but she loved to run. So they put her back in the second year. She beat 50 other goats as a three-legged goat in the race and won the uh, race in 2011. And I thought that was a fascinating story, Ghost, because you can still achieve things that you think you uh, are unreasonable. But we're going to call Peggy Burnout. She's the burnout goat today. And burnout has three components. It's not a single entity, as we talked, that has no clear boundaries, that has no uh, one thing. It's a syndrome. It's a compilation of signs and symptoms. Emotional exhaustion. Every, pretty much every week I've talked to a friend of mine. He's an oral surgeon, and we have discussions about practice, about our daily lives, and one of the things he talks to me about, and I, I listen to him, is how he is physically exhausted, how he's tired, he has insomnia, he has trouble sleeping, he has chronic fatigue as he is, he's defined it. Emotional exhaustion, that's what the psychologists call it in this, in this clinical study, but it includes the physical and the mental. So that's the first component. The second leg or the second component is depersonalization. What does that mean? I have to look this up and figure this out. Well, this is where we've been in practice. We have stressors. We fail to adapt. And it starts to affect the way we look at our patients. It starts to make us look at a patient rather than being Mr. Smith or Mrs. Jones it's the root canal in room one, or the wisdom tooth extraction in room four. And we start to separate the human side of our patients from what we do clinically. We become very cynical at this part, at the, in this component of burnout. And then the third leg, low personal accomplishment. And this is where we have all in the room been successful because you're sitting here, you're dental professionals, you're on dental teams, and this is a high, this is a high functioning group of folks right here, I'm telling you, open-minded, and uh, low personal accomplishment starts to creep in on us when we start to have this failure of adaptation, and we start to turn on ourselves, we start to drop our self-value, our self-worth, and we feel like we haven't accomplished much, and that we're not doing anything of value uh, for our lives. Maybe we're not looking for the purpose in our life or think that we're living the purpose in our life. So these are the three components of burnout. So we're going to switch gears here, give you a little bit of familiarity with what burnout is. I thought I knew I'd use the term, I'd use it incorrectly. 
So now we want to talk about knowing yourself, and that's really my purpose for being up here today. How do we know? How do we know if we're one of the 10 or 12? Is there a way to measure it? Is there a way to find out where we fall on that scale? Are we healthy? Are we adapting? Are we sitting there in our chairs? If I were sitting out there, I would be running through my mind, well, do I check any of those boxes? Am I feeling any of those? Or I feel like I've had any of those occur to me recently. So knowing yourself. I got to reading a lot about this in Dr. Christina Maslach out of Cal Berkeley. She's the, one of the pioneers in burnout studies. She developed the burnout inventory. It's a wellness assessment. And they have a group called Mind Garden. And I got to talking with Mind Garden about what I was going to do here because I was really interested in this topic. And as I talked to them, I, I'm a strong believer, and I've done this, and I encourage you, and that's, that's my primary objective here today, I encourage you to take a wellness or a self-assessment to see where you fall out. And if you're healthy, that's where we want to be. But if you're drifting, be aware. And if you're there, you need to get help. Why? You're sitting there going, why should I take one? Why do I need to take this wellness assessment, this self-assessment? Well, 7 to 7 to 21% is the range in the studies for dentistry. It's prevalent in our profession, folks. And again, we're not talking about the hygienist in our office. We're not talking about the assistants and other folks that work on our teams. We're just talking about dentists. They've done studies all over the world, and it's, it's there. So we need, we need to recognize it and, and understand that it is in our profession. The one that I'm going to offer you today is personal and it's private. We're not going to capture any data. It's not going to be linked to anybody in here. There's going to be data compiled because I want to eventually share it with the group as a group study. And this is based on the research that we're, we're working on. And then if we can prevent or detect this early and catch it upstream from clinical depression, or suicidal ideations, then we win. That's why, you, that's why, in my opinion, that we all need to do this. And just be honest, it's, it takes about 15, 20 minutes. And I work with Mind Garden, and they charge for this. But we worked with them, and it's a $20, $25 value. If you go on their site, you can take it. The one that I'm offering you today doesn't cost you anything. It doesn't require that you log into their site you just have to go through the website I'm going to give you. You can take the assessment. I will tell you this, when you take the assessment, it's a one-time thing. It's a link. You go into it once. You need to designate probably 15, 20 minutes to do it. And it's going to give you your own personal report that you'll be able to see how you fall out on the scale. And there's probably 11 or 12,000 people that have taken this, and you're going to be able to see that in comparison. This is the website, beatdentalburnout.com. You can take that assessment. This is what you're going to get. This is going to be a report. This is the one I took. It's personalized to me. The ones that you would take would be a uh, survey participant because it's anonymous. But you go to that website. It's going to ask for your name and email. That's the where we can follow up with the group report. Again, they're not linked. You can take that at your convenience. And uh, we have 100 of those set aside. And I counted roughly a heads in here. is 100 or 105 people in here. So everybody could take one. Once the links are gone, the licenses are expired, so you don't, you, don't get, you don't get a chance to do it for no cost after that. But that's the website. I can be, I'm around here all weekend. If you want to talk to me offline, if you want to talk to me uh, and, and curbside me and, and tell me your story, or if you have some concerns, I've been here. I, I don't want any of you to go there, and if you're there, I want to at least talk to you about it or listen to you and see what you got going on. Uh, I, I, Got a few little resources that I can point you to if, if you need uh, you need some personal assistance or to try and work with your uh, with your own personal studies to to upright things. Um, with that, I'm going to turn this over to the next person. Dr. Russell Kirk, thank you. Give it up, Russell. This is your third time presenting at Voice of Dentistry, isn't it? Yes, sir. I get, you get better every single. I get time. shorter every time. I know, right? That's oh, thank you very much. Yes, sir. All right. How are you guys doing this afternoon? Are you still hanging in there? We have a ton of really good speakers here this afternoon. I'm very excited that I get to be the guy 
that's, uh, that's announcing it. So uh, let me tell you a little bit about one of our sponsors, a silver sponsor called The Wondrist Agency. Now, literally Wednesday, uh, we came out with a podcast where we, we were talking with The Wondrist Agency. They're very cool. They do some really interesting, authentic marketing. Uh, authentic marketing is the very best kind. So um, go check them out. They're also across the way there. So when we wrap up today, we're having a reception, and the reception, and we're going to have a break here in a little while where you can go out and podcast with people. You can go out in the podcast tent. That's where a lot of the podcasts are. But basically, uh, it's a fun party. We're going to be doing some karaoke in here. Is anyone going to do karaoke, or is it just going to be Jason and I? Anyone? It'll be a really short karaoke session. But I, my trick is, is you probably need to drink first, if that's your thing, and then we'll do the karaoke. But uh, and I know that I, I have been told that Caroline Zeller is going to do karaoke. So we already know she's good. And maybe she'll cuss a little more, too. It'd be awesome. So um, I get to tell a little story here. I'm, I'm, I'm stalling a little bit because I think Justin Moody is still on a pot. No, there he is. He's here. Perfect. I don't have to vamp anymore. Excellent. OK. So this is a cool story. Uh, our very first time doing the Voices of Dentistry was in oh, Nashville, yeah. Tennessee. How many people were at VOD in Nashville? Raise your hand if you were in Nashville. Nice. How many people here have been to a Voices of Dentistry at all, either Nashville or last year here? We have a lot of returning people, and actually a lot of them are out there not, not listening to us talk right now. Uh, it's pretty neat to see people coming back, and like, I walked into the room today and I felt like I knew almost everyone. It's very cool. We have a great community in the podcast community, and this meeting is, is a blast, so keep coming back. Go sign up for the $497 deal. That's the way to do it. So these guys who are going to be speaking next, they're, they're a podcast called the Life in Dentistry Podcast. They originally had a guy who was going to give a talk of his own. He pulled his hamstring last night. He's unable, unable to do it. He's not, he's not feeling well enough to do it. So what do we do? We get the whole rest of the podcast. There's like seven guys on this podcast. They started the podcast after attending the Voices of Dentistry in Nashville. They literally sat down, I think, first with Dr. Russell Kirk, who was just on, and uh, they were so into it. They're all in dental school still. Justin Moody, our co-host, uh, sat across the room from them. Uh, Moody was Moody basically is the heart and soul of this meeting because the very first time we did this, he podcasted for like how, how many hours of content did you have? I did a podcast forever. I know he he. They, I don't even think they left the podcast lounge, and I don't. Maybe they couldn't. I'm not sure they could walk necessarily, but well, they podcasted a lot. And, and, you, they basically had a chance to talk with all these guys, and they were so impressed, and they were so into podcasting, they started their own. So I have great pleasure introducing the Life in Dentistry podcast. Thank you. They gave me a mic. Good. Uh, thank you, brother. Oh, man. Oh. Okay, you guys we'll sit. We got a rest. No, we got, we got a rest. Oh, no, I insist. Get, that, sure? get, that, get this stuff out of here. I thought they just wanted to carry a few chairs to flex his buttons. Right? Yeah, right. look at him, man. All right. He's got huge. So, there's this guy named Cole Hackett. He's supposed to, he's on your, he's on your program. He's supposed to be talking to you. Um, he hurt his little hamstring playing tennis yesterday. Two days ago. <laughs> Two days ago. So he yeah. can't, he couldn't come to the meeting. Um, it was his slide deck, it was everything about him, and um, my friends here were... We were they're, relying they're, on Cole. They, they relied on Cole. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to uh, I'm gonna help them out we're a little gonna bit. We're going to improv. Uh, I'm going to help them out a little bit. Gonna, uh, we'll uh, cool. Yeah, so please don't hold this against us. We're, <laughs> we're, we're so all we're, about being prepared, so we got Matthew but at the this, end. this was, this was told got, to us this morning. So. We've got Singing Scotty in the middle. You're going to know Singing Scotty uh, later on tonight because <laughs> this guy is a karaoke machine, <laughs> like machine. Like you will want to, you will want to tape this stuff and put it out there on. So maybe, it, maybe you want to put them out on the interweb. Maybe a, you know, pound, pound VOD. May, maybe know, a second 20, career. What's that? A second career. Career? Yeah. I, listen, you know, if this dentistry thing ain't working out, <laughs> a, there's 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 a chance yeah. of it. Uh, and then we got Big Joe Blaylock right here. Um, so, Alan, uh, Alan was right. In 20, 2017, we were just guests to come to this Voices of Dentistry thing in Nashville. And they, we really did it in a Roach Motel in uh, Nashville. Um, but 
we didn't really know what we were doing. Like we went there with podcasters and dentist implants and worms. We had this big booth and nobody else had a booth and we like we didn't really know what to do. So and nobody, everybody was coming into the podcast lounge, like looking around, going, "What the hell is this?" So uh, Gabe and I decided that we were going to go down to the liquor store because we bought all these shot glasses and we bought these uh, T-shirts. We got to get this stuff away. So um, we said, "Hey, you know what? We got to loosen this crowd up a little bit." So we went and bought a a couple boxes of Fireball, you know, like where wine comes. So we bought a couple boxes of Fireball. Um, these guys were still in uh, dental school at the University of Kentucky. We call them the Kentucky Boys. And you know there's, there's two things that gets uh, dental students' attention. Free food and free booze. And uh, so we had them at free booze. So uh, okay. uh, they came over and they were like, man, we'd love to do a podcast to talk about, uh, you know, the life and dentistry, like life with dentistry. Because you have to have a life beyond dentistry. The fact that everyone is here means we're all dental nerds. You know, like tonight, we're going to go to dinner, you know, and we'll talk. You know, I love Husker football. Malali loves Husker football. There's only only one kind of football is Husker football. But um, we can have that argument. These guys want to talk about something different. They want to talk about what it's like, what it's like to be a dentist outside of dentistry. You know, what it's like to be a dental student and, and how do we get from point A to point B. So after a couple gallons of fireball, uh, these guys decide they're going to do a podcast. And today you have the Life and Dentistry podcast. They have had, they had their own conference that happens in Lexington, Kentucky. The last two years I've been uh, fortunate enough. These guys did a dental conference before they were even out of dental school. Like who the hell does that? One of their cohorts like, bought a dental practice before he was even out of dental school. Like who the hell does that? Uh, guys that have visions and guys that, are, that, that, I, that reaffirm my belief that dentistry is in the right direction. Uh, so, um, Cole is not here. Is a I, I can't use it. I can't he's a good man. Him. Yeah, he's a good dude. Uh, but these guys, I want them to tell a little bit of their story. Yeah. Um, tell tell us the deal, Big Joe. Yeah, I mean, you know, our our mission and our vision is to add value to other people. So. Um, what, what we've done, if, if you were here last year, you heard us talk about uh, what we were going through six months out of dental school. And at that point, we were seeking mentors. And, and what, what we want to do with our podcast is educate our listeners through our experiences. And hopefully someone learns from you know, our failures, which are many, and some successes as well. And last year, it was about seeking mentors. And, and we did that. You know, Justin Moody and, and Costas and Primus and, and all these guys that speak. And uh, we're a year and a half out now, and something that we got caught up in this year was, was comparing our success to some of our mentors mm -hmm. and some of these guys. And, it, and it's led to um, some dissatisfaction and, and what Cole was going to talk about today and, and kind of where we're at right now is, is understanding that, um, you know, only, only we, can, we can define what our success is, you know, and, and he talks about life and... Um, you know, what, what our success is and what, what we find our values in is our family and our kids. And um, if you're religious, you know, your spirituality. Um, it's easy to go to these conferences and get caught up in dentistry, yep. you know, and it's like, this is all you do. And, and why can't I do these big cases like, like Moody and Mike and, and all these guys? But, uh, you know, what we wanted to hit on today was that, you know, what, what your success is is not defined within, within your, your job as a dentist. It's about um, your life and who you are as a person and the people you impact. Yeah, it's about finding your, your what and why. Um, what's your purpose for living? Um, if it's your career, great. Um, but so many people that I've found, um, they, they chase this dream of, of wanting to be like somebody else, their idol. And if they attain that dream, a lot of times I've seen that it's necessarily not what they expected or wanted. It's all about just figuring out what you want, what's important in life, and, uh, and, 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 and just chasing that. And don't get caught up on comparing yourself to, you know, to, to others. You know, take, take what you can from, from others, but ultimately you've got to follow your own path in order for true happiness. And I, I've, I've, I've found that to be 100% true. true. Absolutely. I mean, I'm new to the game just two years out of dental school. We all are, but I mean, I'm, I've, I've already noticed that. No doubt. And something, something too to add to that too. 
he mentioned about the dental student that bought the dental practice in dental school. Well, that, I was one of them. And I'm here to tell you that that wasn't all roses. It, it was, uh, <laughs> it was <laughs> what'd you it say? Was, you you learned a you lot the hard way. You didn't, you didn't get rich quick. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. A debt quick. As, uh, in debt quick. Real quick, yeah. But that that was that was something that I learned. You know, you, it, it's all about your perspective and how you perceive um, your journey through life. Because I was talking to um, a great friend of ours, Dr. Maloli. Uh, last night, and and I was venting to him about some things going on in, in my life, and, and right now, personally, and it's like, you know, you know, he's an Oscar fan, right? I, I, oh, and I'm a big volunteer fan, we'll, so we'll this is big. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, we, we had a great conversation, and and just in that conversation, it it helped me vent, and, and, and it, my, my perspective of where I am now, and moving forward of what I need to do, um, it was totally different back in middle school and now. So it's like, but it's the mentors and and your family, your wife, people you talk to on a daily basis that are that make an impact on you, and that yeah, you know. What about uh, friends? Um, we'll start with you, Joe. Where are you at today versus where you started in dental school? Are you at the same practice you were at when you started out of dental school? Yeah, um, I am. And are you gonna stay there? I'm not, and honestly, I've been there longer than I than I thought I would be. I thought in dental school by now I would have um, a dental office, and I would be uh, yeah, have a on my way to having a successful office as an owner. Um, but I'm not there, and I beat myself up about that a little bit, actually. And through the process, you know, I think it's happened for a reason, mm -hmm. and the big reason is. I've had to grow as a, I've had to grow as a clinician, as a person, as as someone um, who didn't have clear clarity and direction. Right. Where I was. Scotty, how about you? Are you in the same practice you started at? No, I'm on my second and about to start my third. Okay, Matthew. Uh, second practice. Same practice. You uh, guys stay second, there. Second. Second practice. Oh, second yeah, practice. Not the same. Yeah. Second one he's owned. He's owned too. Right. Mm -hmm. So. If you look at that, you know, most people say, you know, I don't know, what is it, 85% of your associateships, you know, don't make it, you know, you know, you're batting 100% here. We're living, living proof. You know, right and, and we change, and life changes, yeah. and your priorities change, and mm -hmm. if you chase, you know, if you just chase the dollar, that, then you let the dollar define you, you know, but if you want to chase happiness, you know, then you got to be, you can't be afraid not to go get that. That's right. Yeah. You know, and I don't care what age you're at, you know, whether you're, Two years out of dental school or 22 years out of dental school like you got to make you know you got to make a change that's, that, that, that's right for yourself mm -hmm. and, and it's only for you you know it's only for you so uh, what do you think um, what do you want to do yeah so what I want to do is is have a have an office where I can uh, take care of people how I want to take care of them and have the opportunity to, to uh, provide for my family so right now I'm looking at doing a startup office my wife and I uh, have tried to define specifically what we wanted and where we wanted to live. I grew up on a cattle farm in Tennessee and my family thought I would come back and, and run this cattle farm. To them, they thought when you graduate dental school, someone writes you a check for a million dollars. Doesn't work like that, yeah. obviously. Um, so we've located that town and we're in the process of finding a place to uh, do our startup. So things are looking really good. Scotty? So for me, I, uh, I started a, an associateship um, just with a single single office dentist, did not work out. Absolutely no way, it, it, our, our personalities just not, did not mesh. So the last year, I uh, actually went back to my hometown, grew up, I was like the prodigal son returns, goes and gets an education, comes back to help his community, it's been great. The problem is I'm with an office, a group office, we have four other offices and um, there's five partners and my future is very uncertain as far as ownership. And, I, and they've already gotten you know, a few offers uh, from outside corporations and a few of the partners have wanted to sell. So I've had a dilemma the last few months. And do I stay here when my future is uncertain or do I pursue something else? Well, I got another opportunity uh, two months ago to join 
another group office that has three offices, but there's only two partners and I have guaranteed ownership in 12 months, something I've always wanted. I'm never going to be satisfied until I have equity ownership in an office. And, um, but it's been so hard because it's one of the hardest decisions I've ever had to make. Cause every, literally every patient, every other patient I deal with in my hometown, I know where they know my family. And all I get is, I can't thank you enough for coming back, for giving back to your community. And uh, it's been very difficult to um, separate personal feelings and business decisions and what's best for me and my family's future. And ultimately, after a lot of prayer, a couple months of, of just going back and forth, I've decided I've got to take this new opportunity because it's better. It's, it's what's best for me and my family. It's what's best for the, the goals and, you know, of what I want to do with my life, even if that means moving away from my hometown. And I know I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a lot of people probably sad, angry, whatever. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, I can't you let, gotta do, you gotta I do can't let, right I can't let villains get in the way. I, I left that little hometown once, too. Yeah. You know? yeah. And it's, t it's tough. And if, you, if you've never lived in a really close-knit hometown, I'm from South Georgia. I'm just a, I'm just a country boy from South Georgia. <laughs> Small town. Everybody, up, everybody, by the way. Things everybody knows <laughs> everybody. So when somebody actually moves off, becomes some kind of doctor and comes back, it's very rare. And when you do that, you stick out like a sore thumb, basically. I mean, everybody knows you. Everybody knows your, your family. And, uh, and word spreads quickly. And, uh, and my mom works in my hometown. And all she ever gets is, oh, we're, we're so thankful that, uh, that your son come back to, to give back to the, his community. And, you know, and it's been very difficult. It literally one of the hardest decisions I've ever had to make. Sure. But ultimately, you've got to have that, be able to separate the um, personal feelings from and emotions from business decisions and you've got to you've got to ultimately go with what's best for you and your family. Matthew? Well mine's um, more personal than anything. My my situation with, with where I'm at is a permanent uh, situation and, and that I'm I'm very uh, stable in and it's where I'm gonna be. I'm back in my hometown in Cookville, Tennessee and, and which is what my goal always was. And it was to be back with family because I lost my mom in dental school, lost my grandpa, and those are the two closest people to me. And so now the family that I have left, I want to spend time with. And that's a big part of, of my why. And, and when I think about, you know, what makes me happy, what I want, you know, I want to have, a, have my faith is important. So I put that and I've, and I've my perspective is based off of that, and so, and being and being humble, and staying humble, and and knowing that you know if you have five practices, that's awesome. Because when I was in dental school, looking at starting to buy practices early, my goal then was well, hey, we can buy practices, and uh, we'll have ten practices, and then and then we'll have fifteen, you know. But now I'm back in my hometown, and now I'm I, I have came back to my roots. And and that's where I'm supposed to be. And that's okay. And that's right. It's okay. And that's, and that's, that's right. okay. That's, and that's right. I think I think what Scotty says is like you know, change is okay, you know, and and change in your life doesn't have to be okay with everyone else. Mm -hmm. It Absolutely. just has to be yeah. okay, you know, with you. You know, yeah. these guys, you know, they you know they call me a mentor, but these guys have done more for me in my life. You know, they brought me to their conference a couple times. We go to the Buffalo Trace Winery and. Uh, uh, or the distillery, and we have this, uh, you know, you know. I, I, I think God gave us this uh, Freddie, um, yeah. Freddie Johnson, who oh, yeah. gave yeah. us the first tour, and he and he showed us, uh, uh, you know, what it was. He had this quick story about um, he was doing this tasting of whiskeys, and he said there was this guy that was uh, that had flown his friends in on their their Lear jet, and they were pouring. Some of you may have heard the story, but they. Pouring these expensive uh, uh, whiskeys, and uh, uh, you know his, his wife was mad at him, and you know, and and, and he's like, "Well, I have this, and I have this in my cellar, and I have that in my cellar," and and ultimately, you know, he's and the Freddie asked him, he says, "Well, do you do you ever share these Pappy Van Winkles and, and and these expensive wines with your friends, or these expensive whiskeys with your friends?" And the guy said, "Well, no, you know, like like they're expensive." And, you know, Freddie, you know, kind of basically told him, he's like, hey, you know, like what good is it if you don't pour it and share it? Because it's the memory. I mean, they're, they're always going to make more bourbon. 
but you're never going to be able to make more memories. And uh, he talks about how this uh, the, this guy's wife was there and uh, sent him a letter. You know, basically said that uh, uh, he thought about that, and uh, his his oldest son came home from college, and he brought a bunch of his college buddies, and his you know his dad opened up one of these bottles that probably had a sign on it that says, like, you touch it, you're going to die, mm -hmm. you know, on it. And he poured it for his, him and his friends, and he talked about how, uh, you know, his son cried, and it was the first time yeah. they ever hugged yeah. over a stupid bottle of uh, bourbon. But it wasn't a stupid bottle of bourbon. Mm -hmm. what, didn't have anything to do about the bourbon, mm -hmm. you know? No. No. So I would tell you, you know, that, uh, you know, my friendship with these guys is about the memories, you know, and, and about being able to... Absolutely call these guys at any hour of the day and be, you know, friends. First and foremost, friends. You know, and everything after that is, everything after that's kind of irrelevant. You know, money, you can make more money. You know, implants, yeah, we can do more implants. I mean, there's, there's plenty, there's plenty available, you know. They continue to make fireball, like, I, you know, I'm not gonna run them out of fireball, you know. But uh, I tell you what, though, you, I think your true wealth is measured in the amount of friends you have. You know, so and these guys are the best said. ones right here. No doubt. So, no, that's, um, and that's mutual. So what's, uh, what's next? Yeah, so coming up next for us, um, we're kind of in busy season. Uh, we're speaking next week with, with some dental students at the ASDA convention. And then in March, we have the Life and Dentistry Conference with uh, a lot of the guys that you see speaking here are going to come. And, and we were very inspired by Voices of Dentistry and what um, Alan Mead and Mark Costas and Moody and these guys were able to put together to bring, you know, all of you guys listen to podcasts and, and to us, you know, we were starstruck the first time we came here because we sat down like, holy crap, that's Mark Costas. Like, whoa. And to have these celebrities talking to us. We're like, yeah, and, and we're like, what kind of conference is this where you can come and meet these people? Well, what, what we wanted to do was try to bring um, these people to come interact with younger, with dental students at the time and now younger new dentists because they influence us so much. You know, our generation seeks mentors, very, very much so. Um, so our conference is in March, March 23rd in Lexington, Kentucky. You can go to our Facebook page or website to check it out. But um, we, uh, we're going to have some bourbon and going to have a lot of fun and, and interact very similar to, to this conference. Yeah, it's, it, it's, super, it's super good. I've been I've had the memory. fortune to be there the last couple of years. Yeah. And, uh, um, Hope you like if you come, you gotta like bourbon, I think. Yeah, you gotta like bourbon and, and racehorses. And, racehorses <laughs> and bourbon. Yeah, all that sort of stuff. But it is uh, it's about uh, it's about all those things. And you know, you guys giving back already is such a uh, you know, two years out, you know, speaking to ASDA, because it makes a difference. Uh, you know, I think a lot of people well we can't lump all millennials together. I mean, you know, you, so you got the millennial podcast guy out there, out there, you know, you got Sully Sullivan and you got Pay Ray and you know, like two of the guys with the worst ha haircuts in the planet. Um, <laughs> and they're from Tennessee too. Yeah, look at, look at these millennials. They got like great haircuts. Yeah. <laughs> like, they got like all American haircuts. Um, last year, I know, last year we tried, uh, Tarun and I, uh, we volunteered uh, 40 grand to, uh, to uh, Sully Sullivan's uh, charity of choice if we could uh, shave his head. And um, ultimately he went back to his practice and his wife took him straight to, the, uh, to get a haircut himself. So it got us off the hook for 40 grand, but uh, <laughs> uh, it was, uh, um, your point is that the millennials, or whatever, whatever you want to call it, mentorship is not dead. No, absolutely not. You know, and then you're going to see a little bit, you're going to hear some of that from me tomorrow is that, you know, there's phases where you need a mentor and then the best phase is when you become that mentor, yeah. you know, and that's where, you know, life's too short not to get back. You know, it's, it's part of the, it's part of the deal. Yeah. So we were um, just doing a podcast with Dr. Ricardo from Spear Education and, uh, you know, he, he was saying that, you know, it's like you, whatever you give, you end up getting more back in return. And uh, for us, you know, we care about people, you know, as dentists, all of you, you know, our job in dentistry is to take care of people. Um, you know, Mike Fromley says that a lot. That's our responsibility, you know, as, as, as a dentist in your practice, take care of their, their teeth and their health and also the people you interact with on a daily basis. Everyone's looking to you um, all the time for some sort of, sort of leadership. Um, well, it was my honor and pleasure to step yeah. in for the injured. Uh, yeah, I hope, you whole, hope it was fun. Uh, we had a good time. Right? And uh, tonight, uh, again, um, please join Singing Scotty. <laughs>
<laughs> on the stage for uh, karaoke tonight is he will not oh, no. disappoint you. So I give you guys like the life and dentistry guys. Yeah, thanks, man. Love yeah, you, Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Appreciate them supporting this goofy podcaster meeting. We appreciate the faith they have in us. So I have the pleasure of introducing one of my friends, Dr. Aaron Elliott. Now I I've known her for a while. She's been on the podcast like a bunch of times. Um, she is, uh, some people know her as the queen of good air. She is, uh, she teaches, uh, sleep apnea, airway stuff with, with Tarun over at 3D Dentist, but she's, okay, she's a really good clinical dentist. She's a really good speaker, but those are things I like about her. But what I really like about her is her sense of humor. She's probably the best practical joker in the world. The subject of a lot of her practical jokes is actually sitting in the second row here. Um, and I'm just going to say she's my very favorite Idahoan. So... Welcome to this stage, Dr. Aaron Elliott. The good news is there's not a lot of Idahoans, so that's <laughs> not saying much. Thank you for having me here today. Sexy. The dictionary defines sexy as excitingly appealing and glamorous. Sexy is really subjective, so there's no real universal agreement on what is or isn't sexy. But People Magazine has tried to define that for us. For example, this year they named Idris Elba the sexiest man alive. And to be honest, I have no idea who he is. My husband had to remind me that he was um, on a couple episodes of The Office. But in 2016, People Magazine named Dwayne The Rock Johnson the sexiest man alive, and I am not complaining about that. Some may say this Lamborghini Gallardo is the sexiest car they've seen. But then again, I'm from Idaho, where a Ford F-150 with a gun rack gets me going. Does anyone remember this song? Do I have enough non-millennials in the room? The singer Fred was too sexy for his shirt and his car and his hat and his cat. I think he was working on an adult Dr. Seuss book instead. And I know I picked the right profession because when I think about all of the progress and the technology that we have in dentistry, I find it very sexy. But I'm going to share something with you that might not be so sexy. Now, for the record, this was recorded in my bedroom. Are there any women that have to sleep next to something like this? OK, admit it, guys. Are there any men that might sound like this in the room? OK, so I think we can universally agree that snoring is not sexy. The problem is that many dentists don't think that screening and treating our patients for it is very sexy either. And why would they? I have yet to meet a dentist that has had a course on this in dental school. I've met a few younger dentists that have maybe had a few classes. And because we're not picking up a syringe or a handpiece, it's almost like it's not real dentistry. I think we get distracted by these or lack of these because then we can place some implants, right guys? I think we get distracted by the teeth and we forget about the patient beyond the teeth. Snoring is just one of the many signs and symptoms of sleep disordered breathing, which includes sleep apnea. Does anyone know who this is? <laughs> One hint, it's the Godfather. And no, it is not Michael Corleone. Instead, this is Dr. William Dement. He is the Godfather of sleep medicine, who is a physician, not a dentist. And yet he has led the movement for dentists to be involved in sleep medicine. His favorite quote of mine, is that given that the dentist is often the first and only healthcare practitioner to look into the oral cavity, a good knowledge of sleep apnea should be part of the profession's knowledge base. And it, and it isn't. Sleep apnea, in essence, is an abruption of breathing for 10 seconds or more. It's a complete blockage of oxygen to the vital organs and brain. Except the brain is a vital organ unless you're my teenage son who happens to be home right now. It's not something that we do while we're awake, but we're gonna try this exercise anyway, so play along with me. So when I say we're gonna breathe in the oxygen into our lungs, breathe it out, and then hold it. You guys ready? Here we go, breathe in, 
Breathe out and hold it. Now these first five to 10 seconds aren't so bad, but is your heart starting to race? Are you starting to try to prove to your neighbor who's in better shape? And now I think I see some cheating. Almost there. Okay, you guys can breathe. How did that feel? A little panicky? Now imagine that happening over and over again, 30 times an hour, sometimes more, all night long, without knowing that you have the disorder. Now imagine us as dentists looking into these patients' mouths over and over again, all day long, without knowing of the disorder. Sleep apnea, the, the presence of sleep apnea is alarming. It's one in four men, one in 10 women, and 50% of the population over the age of 50. Do any of your demographics in your practice fit these people? Men, women, people over 50. And it's probably more prominent than this. The scariest part is that up to 80 to 90% remain undiagnosed. And we as dentists are on the, on the front lines to spot this condition just by looking in the patient's mouth. For example, 66% of those that suffer from acid reflux or GERD also have sleep apnea. Now you can imagine when the airway is blocked and the patient is trying to breathe and trying to breathe, abdominal contractions increase when breathing doesn't begin. So acid is pushed out of the stomach into the esophagus. Also a vacuum effect is formed and negative pressure builds up and acid is pulled out of the stomach into the esophagus as well. So that is why patients appear to be lying when we ask them about acid reflux. We can see the destruction in their teeth, we can see the erosion, yet they deny it because it's happening at night when they're asleep and unaware. It's kind of like when they say they don't grind or brush their teeth either. We can see the wear, we can see the destruction, but again, they're asleep. And it's related to sleep apnea as well. Untreated sleep apnea can lead to many issues. Excessive daytime sleepiness, fatigue, family discord, depression, hypertension, diabetes, death, and ED. So I think I'm allowed to say that at this meeting because I am told that men actually fear that more than death. A staggering 72% of those that have suffered a stroke also have sleep apnea. Isn't it time we stop ignoring this condition? Even when public figures die due to conditions related to sleep apnea, it'll continue to fly under the radar unless we and our dental team are talking to our patients about it. Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia had sleep apnea amongst several other related medical conditions. And he died in a Texas hunting lodge with a CPAP sitting on his nightstand. He wasn't wearing the mask and the machine was not turned on when they found him. A CPAP, has always been and continues to be the traditional treatment given to patients and sometimes the only option given to patients. And if you're not familiar with what a CPAP is, it stands for Continuous Positive Airway Pressure. It is essentially a reverse vacuum. It doesn't give our body oxygen, it just blasts enough air to open up the airway so that the patient can breathe. The problem is it only works if you use it. And I actually think they're kind of sexy, so I tried one on, and I don't know who wouldn't find that sexy. Justice Scalia went to all the effort to pack a CPAP, unpack it at TSA, to set it out on his nightstand, for it to only to sit unused when we know he had every intention of using it that night. Green Bay Packer great Reggie White died December 26, 2004, at the age of only 43. And what the a medical examiner revealed that sleep apnea contributed to his death. And his wife, Sarah, said that it was claustrophobia that kept him from wearing the mask. And she admitted at a press conference that she was very upset when she found out that there was alternatives, such as an oral appliance, but they were never offered to him. Carrie Fisher died a couple years ago. And the coroner revealed that it was sleep apnea that contributed to the heart attack that she had on that flight to Los Angeles. But do you, do you think that it says sleep apnea on the death certificate? Never does. And we as a dental team can help our patients with an alternative. And that includes in my own family. 
In 2008, when I found out that Dennis could be part of a patient's journey for a better night's sleep, I set out to find a course because I knew at that time that treating sleep apnea was what, much more than taking a couple impressions and handing the patient an appliance. So on the, um, when I decided to go to this course, my dad, who, is, who was a dentist and a huge mentor of mine, asked if he could come. And I said, sure, as long as we get separate hotel rooms. Now, I know that sounds like a weird thing, but we're both so cheap that that was actually a difficult decision to make, like father, like daughter. But what I knew is that I could not share a room with him because he snored so bad. But he snored my whole life and most of his. In fact, I actually hated going camping as a kid because of his snoring, but I also hated the bugs and the dirt. Um, but sharing close quarters with him was miserable. As part of the course, we did a home sleep test. And what it revealed is that my dad's snoring was actually moderate to severe sleep apnea. Now, I know there's a whole bunch of numbers and lines on here, but look at the blue lines right in the middle. Those blue lines represent respiratory disturbances. Every blue line up there tells us that his deep sleep was interrupted. He might not have woken up, but his deep sleep was interrupted and his airway was blocked. The question is, when was he breathing? The scariest part to me was his heart rate. On average, per minute, my dad's heart was beating 87 beats per minute, when we know resting heart rate is 60. When his body was supposed to be resting, it was working overtime. And you can see how brachycardic it was, too. And if you believe we've only been given so many heartbeats in this life, he was wasting them. Also, as part of the course, we had an appliance made ahead of time. So we delivered it, and we had him wear it that night. In fact, he was quiet for the first time ever. And when he went home and wore it, my mom thought he was dead. <laughs> she was downstairs mourning his untimely passing when he came downstairs to ask if there was any coffee. So you can imagine her surprise. And I think she was relieved. Um, actually, <laughs> I know she was relieved because not only was he quiet, but her insomnia was cured too. So when we did the home sleep test with the appliance in place, what it showed, and this is just night one, is how much his heart began to rest. But what my dad said is that he, he didn't know how tired he was until he wasn't tired anymore. Sleep apnea was such a slow progression, was such a part of his life, that he forgot what a good night's sleep was. It was his norm. And he just chalked it up to, I'm, I'm a dentist, I sit in traffic, I have three children, two of them not so good, one golden child. <laughs> he chalked it up to getting older. He didn't know that there was a problem. But what he also said is that he, he knew he would never wear a mask and he wouldn't get surgery. So he would rather live in ignorance than have a disease he was doing nothing about. Which leads me to my second favorite quote by the previously mentioned Godfather of Sleep. And what Dr. Dement said is that ignorance is the worst sleep disorder of them all. So not, not only does that apply to our patients, but to us as dental professionals as well. So my plea to you is that we as a dental profession discover and lead sleep apnea to the forefront of dentistry so that we can help our patients with a change their life. Even if you don't want to build medical insurance, even if you don't want to have to choose which appliance you make, if you don't want to deal with any of that, just learn enough so that you can identify the dental signs and symptoms and start a conversation with our patients. Because this is the one area of dentistry that we not only change a life, but we could save a life. And maybe some marriages along the way. And remember this awful, oh, annoying, and some would say disgusting snoring that you heard at the beginning? Remember, this was recorded in my bedroom where my husband and I sleep every night, except for the nights he has to go sleep on the couch because of this snoring. And spoiler alert, that snoring is me. Which is why, and, and like many of my patients, I was in complete denial. There's no way I sound like that. But that is why my husband pulled out his cell phone and set it next to my head, and that's why I have this audio file for you today. But it's also why 
I wear this. Because this appliance helps us become a normal married couple. So now we fight over the temperature in the bedroom and who's stealing the covers. Because you see, sleeping sexy has nothing to do with lingerie and candles. It has, it has to do with being able to breathe. And while snoring and sleep apnea are never sexy, screening and treating our patients for it is. That's all I got, Alan. Thank you. Dr. Aaron Elliott, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Aaron. She's amazing, isn't she? Give it up for Aaron Elliott one more time. That's a that's a great talk. It's a great talk. Okay, I would like to thank one of our uh, the program sponsor. I have to say our programs we've really stepped it up. I love our programs this year. Sponsored by a guy by the name of Craig S. Cody. He's an uh, he's a he's out across the across the way there again. He's a, a an accountant. And actually, uh, last Monday, I released a podcast that I recorded with him. He's a cool guy. He's coming out with a podcast himself. He's going to talk about a lot of financial issues that affect all of us. So go check him out. Um, I get to introduce the next guy. Now, I've known him for a really long time. We can kind of thank him for the fact that this meeting even exists because... Dr. Tarun Agrawal was one of the guys that started the townie meeting. Has anyone ever been to the townie meeting before? Anyone been back in the day when they were first originally done? That has everything to do with T-Bone. So I kind of owe him a little bit. I've known him for a long time. I liked his post on Dental Town 100 years ago. I've known him, in fact, since he had hair. So uh, that just goes to show how long I've known him. So uh, he's, he's the owner and creator of 3D Dentists. He does all kinds of CB, CE, and he is the host of the T-Bone Speaks podcast. Please welcome to the stage, Dr. Tarun Agarwal, T-Bone himself. My practice as well in doing it professionally. I call it being patient centric. When you become patient centric, you think like the patient. You think about how their time is valued, how is what it takes for them to take time on the to come to an appointment. What, what are our patients asking for? And what does it take to grow? If you answer those two questions, you will always be successful. All right, how are we doing, gang? Thank you, thank you. I, um, I got to give a lot of kudos to my man Jonathan at Interview Media for that, um, 
unbelievable video. He really captured the essence of uh, the American dream, to be quite honest with you. So listen, I want to get started, and I want to kind of talk about uh, uh, some of the challenges that we're facing in dentistry today. So I got to apologize in advance. I'm going to be a little bit forward. I'm going to be myself. I'm going to challenge us a bit. I'm going to call us out. I might curse a little bit, depending on how hot I get. But listen, we're facing three main challenges. Challenge number one is a challenge that's been around forever and will be around forever, so we should stop bitching about it, and that's dental insurance. The bottom line is that for the majority of us, our practices would not be what it is today. We would not have the life we have today if it wasn't for dental insurance, making dentistry more affordable for our patients. We can bitch and moan about their fees, but they bring people in the door. It's a bottom line fact. Number two, and something that's a little bit newer, and that is competition. And competition has been around forever, but competition is changing today. That competition today is private equity money and corporate dentistry, and how it's changing the way we have to practice. And the third challenge that we're facing, and the one that I'm really hot about right now, is the confusion and the noise that we allow ourselves to get into. And that is all based on social media. That is based on people like me that have something to sell you, that have opinions, that have biases. But it creates confusion and noise. And when we let that confusion and noise into our lives, it slows down our progress. It gets us off track. It's an exit. And how many times have we tried to take an exit and says, oh, it's only five minutes to fill up gas. And the next thing you know, it's 45 minutes, an hour later, and you're behind schedule. Now, it reminds me of a story. We moved here in 1977. I was two years old, as the video said. My dad was a dentist in India, couldn't practice in the United States because he didn't want to get licensed because he had to go back to school. And I was there. My brother was in my mommy's belly. The stork was bringing him, is what my dad said. And so my dad did what everybody else does, and every other Indian, he bought a motel. Our motel was $18 per day or $6 per hour. And that's the kind of place I lived in. I lived in room number 40. I picked up and delivered things for the prostitutes and the whores that would stay at our hotel, motel. But what I saw my dad do was work his ass off to build a little bit of a nest egg. And over time, after he got through that period of 10 years, he had started building enough to where there's something extra to save. And then he started investing it in the stock market. And he was losing money, making money. He didn't really know what he was doing. So he listened to the noise that was out there and gave it to somebody to invest. And over a period of his first 20 years, he had accumulated about a million dollars in the market. Not a lot of money by today's standards, but for when you come here from so far away, it's a boatload of money. And what happened was, I was getting married in 2001, and we needed some money to pay for our wedding. Because those of you that have been to Indian weddings, they're outrageous, okay? And the parents pay for everything if they have the means. So my dad called up his broker and said, I need some of my money. The broker sent him a check, and it bounced. My dad said, I'm driving up to New Jersey to come get my money. He got there, and the guy wasn't there. Overnight, his million dollars were gone. Everything he had saved. Everything. And I never saw my dad cry. I never saw him say, woe is me. I never saw him say any of those things. Instead, what I heard him say and what I learned was that I've always made the most important investment. And that investment is the investment in you. He said, it took me 20 years to get there, but today I have the knowledge I have the hands, I have the brains, and I can do it again, and I can do it faster. And our dental practices and our careers are absolutely no different. Our business is our hands. It's our brains. And the most important investment you'll ever make is in yourself. And too often, we're not making that investment. My practice is no different than everybody else's. I take eight PPO insurances. I have team members, they're fantastic. Not all of my team members have been with me forever. In fact, I'm pretty sure not all of them will be with me at the end of the year, okay? My argument would be, on a side note, 
If you've had the same team for a long period of time, is you're stagnant and you're not holding your team accountable and you're not pushing them. You're letting them control you. That would be my perspective on that. As Alan mentioned, we do some wonderful training. For those of you that think my style is good, we would be a good source for you. For those of you that are offended by me, don't show up, okay? It'll be fine. All right, so last year I talked to about 4,990 dentists and dental professionals that responded to a survey that I did asking them about the procedures that they regularly provide in their practice. And the results were pretty interesting to me. So these are the results. So of these roughly 5,000 people, 96% said that they provide hygiene services. 53% said they provide root canals in their practice. 6.9% said they provide sleep apnea services in their practice. 35% said they provide implants. That's a little higher than national average, but we're speaking to a lot of technology-based dentists. But to me, technology-based dentists should be at like 80% providing implant therapy. So I looked at this stuff and I said to myself, what is going on here? And then something stuck out to me. If you draw a line right between what I call the top five procedures versus the bottom five procedures, you'll see a stark difference between those two subsets of procedures. And this is what happens. The top five procedures are all procedures you learned in dental school. It is dental school dentistry. And to me, if you are more than six to nine months out of dental school, you should be past a lot of this stuff. You should be. You're telling me that 20 years after practice, I should be still doing the vast majority of my work should be this. The same shit I learned to do 20 years ago. The bottom five procedures are all continuing education based. Insurance is minimized. Your dollar procedure per hour is maximized. And they're comp almost completely team driven procedures. There are less time. Sleep apnea is a team-driven process. Clear line orthodontics is a team-driven process. Implant dentistry, believe it or not, is a team-driven process outside of the five minutes it should take you to screw something into the mouth. Sedation is a team-driven process. Dental fillings require the dentist to prep it, to do everything. Direct crowns, direct restorations, indirect restorations require the dentist to do the vast majority of the work. So there's a massive difference between the two. So what is and why are we as a profession continuing to do this? So let's take a look at that. So my message ultimately is that I want each of us to go beyond traditional dentistry. We have to, quite frankly. We must if we want to survive in the current environment. In fact, let's look at it closer. What do I think of as a business person looking at this? Where do I want to start competing? In the top five procedures or the bottom five procedures? The bottom five. If so few people are doing these procedures, why in the hell am I trying to attract patients from the top five procedures? Why am I not focused on the clinical skills and the marketing, or whatever it takes. By the way, I don't think you need to market to get those things. Why are we not focusing more on the bottom five procedures? Because we allow the noise of what social media says to get in the way of us making the progress that actually matters. Some gizmo, some gadget, some tactic, some 10x bullshit, okay? All of those things some 3D thing that I try to sell you, some wow crap, okay, some nacho shit, you know, whatever it may be. It's all noise. And none of it's bad, by the way, but it is noise because it takes us away from what matters most. And what matters most is what you want. It's all about you. You're the one that spent four years, eight years in college and dental school. You're the one that spent a million, a million plus to build that practice. You're the one that goes home and deals with all of that stuff. You're the one that's responsible for eight to 10 team members and their families every month and every week when you pay them. Why should it not be about what you want? It should always be about what you want. Absolutely. So we have to go beyond traditional dentistry. So what is the obstacle that's keeping us from getting there? 
And some people will say it's team. Some people will say it's where I live. And Justin Moody lives in God knows where, South Dakota, and places more implants than anybody else in this room. It's, there's all excuses. That's all noise. It's truly a lack of clarity that keeps us from getting there. you got to get clear on what you want and why you want it. And to me, everything you do should be answering one of three things. How does it affect the patient? How does it affect your team? And how does it affect your clinical growth? So when I come to you and say I want you to buy a CEREC, the first thing you say is how does it affect my patient? Second thing you say is how does it affect my team? The third thing you should say is how does it affect my clinical growth? When I say buy imaging, same things. When you listen to somebody else, the noise out there, you should ask yourself, how does it affect these things in this order? And by the way, your patient is your ultimate boss. They pay your bills. They dictate what you do and how you do it and where you do it at. You're not your own boss. Hate to tell you that. Okay, no matter where you are in your life. So let's take a closer look at this. So when we're talking about patients, there's three things, time, fear, and money. Time. What do I mean by time? One is how can we do more procedures on our patients in a single visit so they have to be in our office less? Sometimes you have to slow down and take a step backwards to be actually more efficient. Mr. Jones, today we've got a lot going on in your mouth. Before I put together a plan, I want to give you a choice. We can pick one area and start there, or if you give me an opportunity, if you let me sit down and take a look at everything, I can put together a plan and we can try to knock this out in less visits. Would you prefer to come four or five times or would you prefer to come once or twice? Which one works better for you? Take a step backwards to be more efficient and time focused for your patients. In fact, the vast majority of us have lost complete reality of how time affects our patients. That 10 minute post-op check or five minute post-op check for you is a half a day for your patient. They gotta start, stop thinking about work, they gotta leave work to be on time, they gotta fight traffic depending on where you live, if you live in rural areas, they gotta fight the cows and the deer to get through to and get there, and then they have to get the appointment done, you don't see them on time, and then they gotta leave, and then they gotta go back to their life, they gotta get refocused and re-energized and get back on task of what's going on. Imagine if one of your, if your hygienist or your assistant said, hey doc, I gotta go for a 10 minute post-op check at my doctor's office. It's only 10 minutes, I'll be right back. How much time are they gonna take off of work and how many patients are they not gonna see for that 10 minute post-op check? And we are asking our patients to do that over and over and over again. So be patient-centric. All your patients have a camera in their pocket. All of you have a camera in your pocket. Have your patient take a picture of it and send it to you. Text it to you. Hey, this is what it's looking like. This is what it's feeling like. Great, I want to see you. Great, I don't need to see you. Be more patient-centric. The second part of time, and many of us won't like to hear this, is that the marketplace is changing. Today, it's no longer good enough to be open 8 to 5. When I started, it was 8 to 5, 4 days a week. Today, it's eight to five, five days a week. Tomorrow, it's gonna to be eight to five, six days a week. In fact, I would argue it's not any longer eight to five, it's seven to seven, or six to seven, or six to eight, because that's what our patients are looking for. That's what the marketplace has changed to. And the question is, I'm not saying you gotta do it today, but you have to start thinking about how am I gonna respond to the changing marketplace so I don't get caught behind. What do I have to do? What cultural shift do I have to make in my practice to get my team members ready for that? What cultural shift do I have to make in my family life for me to make that happen? What outside dentist may I need to bring into my practice to help make that happen? What rules will I have to put in place to make me not mind staying that late? We have to be proactive about what's coming. It's clearly obvious to me. How many of us remember stores not really being open on Sundays? Are stores open on Sundays? How many of us remember stores not being open on Thanksgiving? 
I remember on Thanksgiving and Christmas, only Chinese restaurants were open. And today, what the hell isn't open on Thanksgiving and Christmas? Our industry is just a reflection of consumer mindset everywhere else around us. So we've got to get with the picture. How are we addressing our patient fears? Are our patients fearful? Absolutely. How many of us offer sedation services? My study said what, 25, 30% offer sedation services. That's 70% of people that you can differentiate yourself from by offering sedation services. Now let's take that a step further. Don't offer sedation just for those patients that ask for it. Proactively make it known that you want your patients to be sedated. Let them say, no, I don't need to be sedated, versus yes, I want to be sedated. And they will say yes more often. Because many times, men especially, are absolutely afraid to say I'm afraid, and we're the biggest pansies in the chair that there are. So you got to be proactive in offering the services that you want for your patients. In fact, I want all my patients to be sedated. So just make it happen. How are we addressing our money problems for our patients? It's a price versus affordability talk. Our problem isn't our price. Our challenge is, is how do we make it affordable for our patients? We saw a massive increase in our Invisalign cases by making a simple change. Simple change in our practice. In fact, that simple change actually raised our fees. We went from saying, Mrs. Jones, Invisalign is $4,000 a case, to saying Invisalign is $1.99 per month without interest and nothing down. And now we went to a greater case acceptance, and I went from a $4,000 fee to a $4,800 fee. It's not price. It's not price. Stop trying to save three cents on your products. It is affordability. And the problem when you focus on price, in my opinion, is you're teaching your team members to culturally focus on price. And everything they talk about with your patients begins to talk about price and talk about insurance and talk about all the things that are noise that get in the way of our patients saying yes. So we got to focus on the time, fear, and the money for our patients. Now, let's move on to our team. So what have we done in our practice and by the way, I only came up with these, I, I didn't go into this knowing this. Somebody asked me to reflect of how we got here. And I only know how I got there after I get there. And then you can look back and say, this is what I did. Well, these are the things that we did. So when we talk about team, I teach a concept of replacing yourself. I'm very, very clear, probably to my detriment, most people call me a jerk or an asshole sometimes, okay, or man, much of the time but I'm clear with my team members that if you are doing the same thing you're doing today, two years from now, you won't be here. You need to learn to replace yourself. And it is a foreign concept to most people, dentists included. What are you doing today so that you don't have to do what you're doing today? What are you doing to build your practice so somebody else can do what you do? That is the only real way we're gonna create growth. The reason I'm doing more implants today is not because I'm marketing because we don't market. It's because I created that time in my schedule by teaching somebody else to do the things that were taken up all my time. I replaced myself. I replaced the top five procedures in my practice and gave it to somebody else, handed it to them. And I said, if you just focus on this for a year, year and a half, you can do the bottom five procedures because by that time, I'll be tired of the bottom five procedures too. And we got to teach our team members that. Teach your assistant that I don't want you to be a clinical chairside assistant forever. I want you to create your own spot in the practice. And I'll refer to Liz in my practice. She was my chairside assistant for eight years. About eight years after she was in, which is about two years ago, I said, Liz, you got one year to find me another assistant because I got something better for you. I'm going to move you into my sleep role. And the reason we're doing more sleep, not as much as Aaron, as much as that bothers me, more than Sully, just so everybody knows, okay? More than Sully, just so we know. The reason we're doing that is because we taught Liz to replace herself 
and to create a role, instead of hiring from the outside, take the people inside and move them up. How many of you have patients or friends, then you, they say, hey, I'm leaving a great job at a corporation, and they say, there's no upward movement for me? How many of us have heard that? What is the upward movement for your team members in your practice? What is the upward movement for you in your practice? You have to teach people to replace yourself. It is important. And people that hold on to things because that's the only thing they know are holding you and your practice back. Get rid of them. Number two, know the score. You got to know the score. And the score is not all these fancy dashboards, which are great, by the way. I have them all. I have no earthly idea what the hell to do with the information. It's just more noise. But we got to know the score. I ask Liz. I'm going to keep going to Liz. I don't ask her how many sleep appliances we're doing. I'm saying how many people are we talking to about sleep? How many implants we did is a lagging number. It is too late to fix it. The better question is, how many patients are we talking to about it on a daily basis? And how many are we spitting out that did it? So we can diagnose where the gap is. And what stage of the process are we losing patients? It's not the number you did, it's how many people you talked to about it. That's the most important number. And the number changes from person to person in your office. Your front office people should know your production, everybody should know your productions and collections, but your front office people should be focused on your insurance AR, your payment plan AR, and your patient AR, and recall and all that stuff. Your hygienist should be focused on how much perio they're doing, which patients, how many patients they're talking to about perio, how many patients they're calling on a daily basis for recalls, how many patients they're calling about unscheduled treatment. Your assistants, depending on the role they have, should be knowing how many implants are scheduled next month, how many implants are we, patients are we talking about. They should, my assistant should be going to my hygienist and say, hey, you've only talked about X number of patients about implants. What's going on? How can we help you? It creates a culture of team ownership. The third thing is you gotta teach people to own their space. And what that means to me is fess up. The other day I'm doing a root canal. I hate doing root canals, by the way. Now, I, I'm good at them, but I hate doing them. It takes way too long to do a root canal. I can place like six implants in the same time. But I was doing a root canal, and my, assist, my second assistant came to me and said, hey, uh, we forgot to change the trap. Somebody forgot to change the trap, and we got to turn the suction off while you're working on your patient. I blew a lid in front of my patient. They're straight in front of my patient. My patients know me, they understand what I'm like. I said, you say somebody forgot, you tell me who that somebody is. She looked at me and says, I don't know. I said, it's you. <laughs> Your job is to change the damn trap every week. So own your space. How many of you walk into operatories you don't have gloves? How many of you go in to do a procedure and there's no more bands left, there's no more rings left? There's no more something left. Own your day. You have one operatory. Make sure that shit is full all the time. And when you don't, when you make a mistake, just fess up to it. It's okay. Because when you fess up to it, how can you be mad at them? You can't. And if you get mad at them when they fess up to you, shame on you. Coach your people to be better. Own your space. Own how clean it is. I went into the operatory one day for my hygiene operatory, and I wiped the bottom of the chair. I'm like, what is this? She's like, we have cleaners. I go, great. Call the cleaners and tell them to clean better. Don't give me the excuse. Just because you have the privilege of having a cleaner doesn't mean that you don't hold them accountable. Own your space. That is your operatory. Make it fantastic. I said, do you go to your house? And if I went to your house, would there be dust on your dining table? Of course not. Then this is your workspace. Make it clean. Be proud of it. Be absolutely proud of it. And I don't say it in a mean way. Most of my team members will tell you I'm a teddy bear. Well, except when I, need, don't need, when I need not to be a teddy bear. Then I'm a grizzly bear. So teach your team to replace yourself, to know the score, and to own their space. Now let's move on to the clinical part of it. And for me, I know there's so much more here but I'm going to focus on three things. I don't love hearing the word ROI. I think it's a fallacy. 
What I focus on clinically is what I call the SOI, sleep, ortho, and implant. If you grow these three portions of your practice, you'll do unbelievably well. And the truth is, is you don't have to do one bit of marketing to grow this part of your practice to something that makes a dent. It moves the needle. To change a little bit about what Aaron said, it is estimated that one billion people have sleep apnea in this world. That's one out of seven and a half people. One billion people have sleep apnea. And yet, only 6.9% of dentists are actively providing that therapy for their patients. Medical insurance pays for the majority of it, making it easier for our patients to accept treatment. Now, we can argue about how I want to be insurance free and all that nonsense. Just take the damn money the insurance company's giving you and make it easy for your patients to pay for it. Stop fighting the hard fight. Focus on what works and get to the next step. Get to the point where you're financially flexible and you can choose not to take insurance. But take it along the way, in my opinion, to get there. Orthodontics. Why are we not doing more ortho cases? How much easier can they possibly make it for us? 80% of them need refinement, just so you know. But how much easier can we make it? And how much easier can we make it on the dentist where the dentist's job is really to do what? For those of us that do clear line of therapy, what is the dentist's job? To approve the clin check and do the IPR. That's it, correct? Who puts the buttons on? Who sees the patients for follow-ups? Who takes the photographs? Who takes the iTero to see the, how the progress is going? Who calls the, the lab or the, to make sure everything's on track? Who files the insurance? It's a totally team-driven process. And it's a, pro, a procedure that only 30% of your competitors are doing. And then there's dental implants. How many of your patients are missing teeth? How long does it take you to place a dental implant? For Danny, Danny, you in here? How long does it take you, like legitimately, how long does it take you to place an implant? Like the worst case scenario. 15 minutes. All right, what is your fee for that in Louisiana? $2,000. All right, how many fillings do you have to do for $2,000? And does that take you 15 minutes to do? How many of you said, I'd love to do more implants, or love to do XYZ, more of XYZ, but I'm too busy? You're too busy doing shitty stuff. Excuse my language, I'm just passionate about it. And listen, I want to be clear about this. I want to say this. If you do dental school dentistry, I have nothing against you. If you do dental school dentistry and complain about it, I got a lot of things against you. You can make an unbelievable living being a bread and butter dentist. An unbelievable living, and that is okay. Just don't complain. Don't complain when you slow, your practice slowly erodes when your team members leave because there's no upward movement for you and your patients are exposed to a new way of getting things done. Don't complain. Implants are unbelievable. It's amazing how we can help patients and how many of our patients are asking for this treatment. Danny, if I use you again, do you live in a big metro area? That's not a big metro area, correct? Are people rich where you live? Not really. $60,000. And you guys are doing way more implants than I'm doing. Like you do per month probably what I do a year. It's excuses. It's noise of whatever excuse you give me, it's noise of why you're not doing it. Don't say you're scared. I, fell, I passed out watching a tooth being taken out in dental school. I close my eyes given my first shot. I still do that occasionally. <laughs> They're excuses. And I apologize if my calling you out on your excuses offends you. 
I apologize. Last couple of slides here. The power of 5%. Here's what I need you to do. Take out a piece of paper or whatever you got. Write down the number of active patients you have in your practice. I believe that the noise out there that we should be shooting for 50, 60, 70, 80% case acceptance is total garbage, like complete garbage. I want you to shoot for 5% case acceptance. But the premise of that is that you give every patient a chance to say yes to the best. Every patient a chance to say yes to the best, and all you need is 5% case acceptance. Case acceptance is easy. Show people what's going on, be truthful and honest with them, look them in the eyes, and give them a choice, and accept whatever decision they make. Write down the number of active patients you have in your practice. Now, first thing, I already told you that one-eighth of them have sleep apnea. So get your calculators out except for the Asians, okay, and divide how many ever active patients you have by eight. And that's how many sleep apneas you have in your office. And then multiply that number by 5%, and that's how many sleep appliances you should be easily able to do if you stop listening to the noise in 2019. Get the right education, get your team on board, stop going to crap alone, just spend the money, take the right team members, and if they hold you back, slowly get rid of them. Don't go back and get rid of them all, okay? That's a bad idea. Slowly get rid of them. 5%. Now take the same number of active patients you have and then answer the question, what percentage of your patients could benefit from orthodontic treatment? Not malocclusion, no, no patient gives two shits about malocclusion, okay? A line of cases you should be doing in your practice. 